واعلن استقالة الحكومة استقالة كان ينبغي أن تحصل منذ زمن طويل بات عن آلاف الخبراء الروس والإيرانيين ومقاتلي حزب الله Good afternoon and thank you for joining us on Future TV. These are your Wednesday headlines. The March 14 General Secretariat says the cabinet resignation is a sign that Hezbollah's regional agenda has become a burden on its allies. The Arab League says member states have the right to provide military support to Syrian rebels as measures for self-defense. And US Secretary of State John Kerry meets with his French counterpart Laurent Fabius in Paris to discuss aid to the Syrian opposition. In its weekly meeting, the March 14 General Secretariat noted that Hezbollah's allies can no longer cover up the party's regional agenda. It claims that Prime Minister Najib Miati's resignation is a result of the involvement of Hezbollah and its allies in the Syrian crisis. The Secretariat stressed the importance of adhering to the Bahabda Declaration which steers Lebanon away from regional crises and which has been used to back its dissociation policy towards Syria. The alliance also called on President Michel Sleiman to immediately set the date for parliamentary consultations to appoint a new prime minister in hopes that such a change will be an opportunity for all sides to return to respecting the constitution. MPs from the March 8 alliance are calling on Speaker Nabi Habiri to hold a parliamentary session to vote on the ratification of the orthodox law proposal. It ratified the draft law. If ratified, the draft law would replace the 1960 law currently in use. MP Ibrahim Kinaan defended the orthodox project, saying it offers Lebanon a historical chance to adopt a new electoral law that represents all the Lebanese segments equally. He said the March 8 coalition is not against consensus, but wants to avoid postponing the elections, which are scheduled in June. For its part, the March 14 alliance is due to meet this evening to tackle the electoral law issue. During a phone call with Michel Sleiman, UN chief Ban Ki-moon expressed hope that Lebanon's rival parties will engage responsibly with the president to resolve the current political crisis. Ban expressed his strong support for Sleiman's leadership in preserving the security and stability of the country. He stressed the importance of Lebanon's dissociation policy with Syria their conversation comes against the backdrop of Prime Minister Najib Miati's resignation last Friday. Ban Ki-moon also expressed his solidarity with Lebanon in its efforts to assist the growing influx of refugees fleeing the violence in Syria. He advised Sleiman to urge the international community to do more to help Lebanon deal with the serious humanitarian situation. Now, leaders at the Arab League summit in Qatar have expressed solidarity with Lebanon, promising political and economic support to help it maintain unity, security, stability and sovereignty. The leaders praised the Lebanese army's role in asserting state sovereignty in the south and safeguarding stability and civil peace. But it is not clear whether the Arab states will provide military or financial assistance to boost the army's military capabilities. The summit also voiced its support for the right of Lebanon's government and resistance to liberate and recover the Shabha farms and the village of Rajar, areas occupied by Israel, as well as defend the country against any Israeli aggression. The residents of the northeastern town of Arsil have denied any link to the kidnapping of a man from the Jafar clan. At a press conference, municipal chief Ali al said the kidnapping has nothing to do with them adding the town would hand over the suspect if he is a resident. The statement also called on the Jafar clan to avoid acts that could lead to strife and on the state to settle the case of the kidnapped men and punish the perpetrators. The wave of sectarian kidnapping started on Sunday when Jafar was kidnapped by un unidentified assailants and reportedly taken into Syria. In revenge, armed men from his family kidnapped several residents of Arsil, al hujeri said there is unconfirmed information that the number has now reached nine kidnapped. And three Lebanese um, have been kidnapped in Nigeria. Kidnappings for ransom are common in the African country and most have occurred in its all-rich southern delta. The country has witnessed a series of kidnappings in recent months. They have been linked to Islamic extremist groups rather than criminal gangs such as Ansaru, who recently claimed to have executed seven foreign hostages, including two Lebanese, but this claim could not be verified.
Arab League member states have the right to provide military support to Syrian rebels. This is according to the organization's Deputy Secretary General. Speaking at the closing meeting of the Arab Summit, Ahmed bin Hili called on regional and international bodies to recognize the Syrian National Coalition as the sole legitimate representative of the Syrian people. The summit draft declaration notes that reaching a political solution is a priority in ending the Syrian crisis. It also affirms every state's right to present all kinds of measures for self-defense, including military ones, to support the Syrian people and the Free Syrian Army. Meanwhile, Iran and Russia have criticized the Arab League for allowing an opposition leader to fill Syria's vacant seat at the summit, describing it an illegal and dangerous behavior. And this comes as the Syrian National Coalition opens its first embassy in the Qatari capital, Doha, in presence of Arab and Western ambassadors, the SNC's president, Maaz al Khatib, and Qatar's state minister for foreign affairs, cut the ribbon at the entrance to the embassy. As the national anthem played, representatives from both sides stood underneath the Syrian opposition's flag. Syrian President Bashar al-Assad has appealed to the leaders of the BRICS countries to intervene to stop the violence in Syria. The five-nation economic forum includes Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa. Assad said Syria is being subjected to what he calls acts of terrorism backed by Arab, regional and Western nations and encouraged dialogue in his country's two-year conflict. He added that the Syrian people is hoping the BRICS countries will send out moderate forces to spread peace and security. UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon has named a Swedish scientist to head a UN investigation team into allegations that chemical weapons were used in Syria. Ake Selström is an accomplished scientist with a solid background in disarmament and international security. The UN said it will investigate Syrian allegations that rebels have used chemical arms in an attack near the northern city of Aleppo. But Western countries are seeking an investigation of all claims about the use of such arms. If the UN team proves Damascus has indeed used chemical weapons, this will represent another blow to Bashar al-Assad's efforts to retain power. Now, on the other hand, it could make countries even more reluctant to support the opposition should the investigation reveal that rebels have used them. And coming up next, a British man singing revolutionary songs rises to fame in China. Stay with us for the story. Welcome back. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry has met with French Foreign Minister Laurent Fabius in Paris to discuss aid to the Syrian opposition as well as the situation in Mali. France has been among several European countries advocating military aid to Syrian rebels and urging Washington to expand its own assistance. Kerry is also due to meet French business leaders and entrepreneurs to look into some ideas to promote economic growth and job creation in the U.S. and Europe. On to Egypt, where President Mohamed Morsi said the parliamentary elections will be held in October with Parliament in session before the year's end. The vote was initially scheduled for April, but a court ordered its cancellation because Morsi ratified the new electoral law without sending it to the Supreme Constitutional Court for approval as required by the Constitution. The President has repeatedly insisted that elections will usher in stability, dismissing criticism that the timing of the polls was wrong, with the country gripped by unrest and deep political division. Egypt's main opposition bloc, the National Salvation Front, has already announced it will boycott the vote, expressing doubts over its transparency and demanded a new electoral draw. Now for a brief look at some other news. In Iraq, two attacks in different parts of the country have killed five people and injured 25. A parked car bomb dripped through a residential area in the town of Musayyib, some 60 kilometers south of Baghdad, killing three people and wounding 14. In a separate incident, a bomb targeted a restaurant in the town of Medin, killing two people and wounding 11. Iraqi civilians are frequent targets for insurgents seeking to shake confidence in government efforts to maintain security. Oscar Pistorius' elder brother, Carl Pistorius, has arrived in court facing trial over the death of a woman in a road accident five years ago. He faced his guilty murder charge following the death of a motorcyclist in 2008. The case is unrelated to the Valentine's Day shooting of his brother's girlfriend and attracted little publicity until the arrest of his brother propelled the family into the glare of a global media spotlight.
And in Taiwan, an earthquake measuring 6.1 on the Richter scale has struck the country. At least one person was killed and 19 injured. The island experiences several minor earthquakes, so evacuation procedures are well practiced. Buildings are also constructed to withstand the tremors, so damage was limited. The epicenter was in Nantu, the country's second largest province, 250 kilometers south of the capital, Taipei. In 1999, this is where a 7.6 magnitude quake killed more than 2,300 people. Former CIA Director David Petraeus has spoken for the first time since stepping down from the agency last November. He publicly apologized for an extramarital affair which caused him to resign from his post. Please allow me to begin my remarks this evening by reiterating how deeply I regret and apologize for the circumstances that led to my resignation from the CIA and caused such pain for my family, friends, and supporters. This has obviously been a very difficult episode for us. But perhaps my experience can be instructive to others who stumble or indeed fall as far as I did. One learns, after all, that life doesn't stop with such a mistake. It can and must go on. And the effort to move forward over the rocky path of one's own making is vital, inescapable, and ultimately worth it. I know that I can never fully assuage the pain that I inflicted on those closest to me and on a number of others. I can, however, try to move forward in a manner that is consistent to the values with which I, to which I subscribe before slipping my moorings and as best possible to make amends to those I have hurt and let down, and that is what I will strive to do. North Korea is threatening to cut its military hotline with South Korea, the final official communications between the two countries warning of a simmering nuclear war. Pyongyang Anger, Pyongyang's anger at the international community, mainly the U.S., has escalated in recent weeks. Few believe that the North will actually risk starting an all-out war, but Washington says it is prepared for a contingency. In addition, U.S. and South Korea have been conducting joint military drills. Pyongyang was slapped with increased UN sanctions after its nuclear test last month. And finally, this British man has risen to fame in China. Ian Inglis appeared on several TV shows wearing a red army uniform and singing communist revolutionary songs. The 34-year-old from Wales who lives in the southern island of Hainan with his Chinese wife said singing revolutionary songs serves multiple purposes. Let's listen to him. I really came across these songs by accident. I had heard about this kind of song from the former Soviet Union and other Eastern European countries. Then when I came to China, some friends introduced them to me. Um, you know, Chinese people like to go to karaoke a lot, and uh, I just heard a few that were quite catchy. I had already um, learned one myself, um, just for fun. I mean, a lot of these songs were written purposefully, very simply, with catchy tunes, simple lyrics, lyrics that repeated themselves so that the masses could sing them, you know. And uh, as a foreigner learning these, actually it's really interesting to learn about recent Chinese history. And, you know, as a student of the language, it's a good way to improve your language skills and learn a lot of vocabulary, excuse me, vocabulary that you might well not otherwise use. But foreigners or people who obviously look foreign who sing old revolutionary styles, uh, style songs with a bit of gusto. I, I mean, they're just, and who are willing to get on the stage or the television and sing them, but probably very few and far between, I think. And, uh, you know, these songs are not popular with young people, but say with the 50 plus age group, they go down a treat. And um, yeah, I, th I think it was mainly for novelty value and, and also a, a bit of nostalgic value as well. Um, there aren't even that many Chinese people who sing these songs anymore. They're, they're a bit of a dying, a dying sort of uh, art, if you like. And uh, um, I was trying to revive them somewhat, and I think people appreciated that. <laughs> And this marks the end of our bulletin for today. Now, for a reminder of our top stories. 
The March 14 General Secretariat says the cabinet's resignation is a sign that Hezbollah's regional agenda has become a burden on its allies. The Arab League says member states have the right to provide military support to the Syrian rebels as measures for self-defense. And U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry meets with his French counterpart Laurent Fabius in Paris to discuss aid to the Syrian opposition. Thank you for watching Future TV. I'm Nur Haile in Beirut. Join us again tomorrow at the same time for your latest news from Lebanon and the world. Goodbye. قال كان ينبغي أن تحصل منذ زمن طويل ماذا عن آلاف الخبراء الروس والإيرانيين ومقاتلي حزب الله